Welcome to another panel in our series of the Summer of Open Data. My name is Stefan Verhulst. I'm the co-founder of GovLab and also uh, part of the Open Data Policy Lab. The Summer of Open Data is an effort to bring uh, distinguished experts in the open data space to really explore what we call the third wave of open data. And by the third wave of open data, uh, we mean progress being made in four big areas. One area is the move from uh, data and open data at the national level to the subnational, provincial state level. Second area is the move towards reusing data through the use of data collaboratives where data might be more or less open, but at least where there is a certain understanding of functional access to data that can serve the public interest. Third area in our third wave of open data is then related with actually governance, having more open data at the subnational and even access to private sector data, but in a manner that is responsible. And then lastly, we are also interested in exploring how can we establish data and open data in a more demand-driven kind of way. And so those are the four areas that we are exploring in our summer of open data with regard to the third wave of open data. With that, let me then turn immediately to our distinguished panel that we have uh, today that will explore some of those uh, elements. And I think we have the creme de la creme today of the uh, data space. And without, uh, 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 or instead of me introducing every person, I will call upon everyone to introduce yourself and briefly indicate uh, what's the relationship uh, uh, between what you're doing right now and the third wave of open data. And you're also uh, free to indicate uh, what else you are doing if you're not on a Zoom call. So with that, uh, Malar, uh, let me start with you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, hi, uh, I'm a senior data scientist and a program manager at the World Bank. Um, I lead a team that's responsible for the data management and dissemination functions uh, needed for the production of key data products, um, such as the open data website of the bank, if you've all been there, uh, and the bank's uh, first integrated data catalog. Uh, and one of the team's uh, main goal is to promote data sharing. Um, using open data principles uh, within the World Bank uh, through the Development Data Hub program um, and also eliminate data silos by provisioning consistent tools, policies, and uh, by creating a network of curation teams within the bank. Uh, this year, uh, I also wear the hat of the manager of the World Development Report 2021. Um, the official title is Data for Better Lives. Uh, this is a flagship report that will for the first time focused on the role of data for development um, with, uh, with a focus on low and middle income countries. Um, so, uh, you know, everything that, uh, that is being dis discussed in this uh, context of summer of open data is very relevant to both the work that I do um, at the data group uh, and also for the WDR. Uh, so it's great to be here uh, among very esteemed panel members and uh, share some early ideas uh, that's coming through through the WDR process. Great, thanks Malara, and thanks for joining us. Uh, Jamie. Hello everybody, my name is Jamie Boyd. It's a pleasure to be joining you today from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people. I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Digital Officer for the Government of British Columbia. British Columbia is the westernmost province of Canada. We're about five million people right on, on the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and my job is essentially to accelerate digital change and digital government um, within the public sector in, in my province. Uh, we essentially want to adopt modern tools from the internet era, from the fourth industrial revolution, in an effort to deliver excellent services to the people of British Columbia. Um, in terms of the importance of data, we can't really provide great services if we aren't using data. Uh, I'm a long, long-standing advocate for open data, um, within the province, we've made a lot of progress on open data, also on different kinds of data management. A lot of times we're administering fairly uh, sensitive or personal data, uh, so we take a fairly nuanced approach to, to ensure that we're, we're being good data stewards. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be uh, sharing this panel with, with, uh, with such a wonderful panel. 
Great. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for joining us from uh, uh, British Columbia. And uh, let's go straight to Arturo. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure where you are these days, Arturo, but uh, 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 eager to learn uh, uh, where you are at the moment and also what your uh, work is these days. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm at home uh, in, in Virginia. Uh, I work in the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really uh, honored to be in this panel. Um, I work, uh, I co basically coordinate activities around uh, data, uh, open data, of course, the, being the, the, the biggest and longest one, but we are starting to ever more start, uh, uh, you know, engagements around data protection, around uh, uh, access to information, cybersecurity, uh, cross-border data regulation. So I have that hat around data. Uh, I also have the digital identification uh, uh, sort of uh, hat within the, 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 the bank. So I also coordinate those um, activities. And then I take part in digital transformation projects across the region. So basically we work with uh, 26 member countries or borrowing countries, uh, all of them in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, that's basically in a nutshell. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Arturo, and thanks for taking the time in your busy schedule uh, to reflect on uh, what we will start immediately, reflect on some of the aspects of the third wave of open data. And let me start with uh, Malar. Uh, Malar, you already uh, indicated that you are finishing up a, uh, a large uh, initiative uh, trying to understand the value proposition of data for development, and uh, specifically, uh, what I'm interested in is trying to understand what you've learned with regard to the value proposition of data reuse uh, uh, and, uh, and also to what extent uh, uh, we are seeing the uptake of data collaboratives as it relates to data reuse. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, all great questions. Um, I have to just clarify something. Had nowhere close to finishing the report yet. <laughs> We're still in kind of the early stages, but um, but uh, I, I'd like to start with one of the main messages of the of the WDR 2021 report is that uh, much of the value of data that exists today is still untapped, waiting to be realized. So uh, data typically collected by one party, uh, you know, for one particular purpose, uh, but then it remains available for uh, you know potential reuse that may generate economic value. Uh, far beyond those originally anticipated. And, you know, we've seen several studies that showcase this vast potential of uh, such data reuse, including the use of COVID case data more recently. Uh, but I'd like to focus a little bit more on the barriers, right? I mean, uh, while, we, while we talk about some of these, uh, you know, some of this really transformational um, potential from such reuse, we still have, uh, we still grapple with, uh, uh, you know, many of these barriers, and I think understanding these barriers better is, is essential for uh, making uh, data reuse work, um, uh, you know, for all populations. Uh, so these, some of these barriers range from misaligned incentives to disorganized and incompatible data systems, and I, and I think um, one of the most foundational issue is the fundamental lack of trust. Uh, and this lack of trust stems from many concerns uh, about personal data protection, surveillance, misinformation, attacks on data systems, and potential abuses of market power in database businesses. Uh, and these issues are actually more chronic for countries suffering from fragility, poverty, and weak institutions. Uh, so if we then take a step back and say then what, you know, how do we realize then this vast potential that we talk about from use and reuse of uh, data, uh, what we think is required is a well-functioning national data systems. Uh, and what we mean by that is um, a, a, a national data system that promotes data flows uh, much more proactively, uh, supported by data governance frameworks um, in a way that it can be used repeatedly by a wide variety of stake stakeholders at subnational level, at national, and across borders as well. Um, and, um, and especially, uh, you know, if such a system can enable better access to data to individuals, uh, you know, who can then feel more empowered, uh, you know, to be more informed uh, and directly use the data to better their lives. 
Uh, and when we when I talk about data governance frameworks, what we mean by that is frameworks that enable use and reuse of data, but also the frameworks that create safeguards to mitigate risks against harmful outcomes. You know, some of the issues that I talked about in terms of uh, data protection, privacy, and uh, abuses of data that can actually harm people uh, on the other side of you know, the, the data use spectrum. And uh, if we were to think about what are some of the key pillars of such data governance frameworks, uh, we, we kind of put them in three buckets. Um, and uh, the first one is policies, laws, and regulations. And second is infrastructure. And the third is institutions and people. Uh, and how these, or these governance models and mechanisms are uh, organized will depend on the country context. You know, one country has a more, takes a more centralized approach, another country a decentralized approach might work. Uh, but what we can learn is uh, from some of the good practices that are being followed uh, in, some, uh, in some of the countries and see how that will apply in, in a specific country context. And I think one such uh, very promising um, model is this idea of a data trust. Uh, and, and, and I think it is especially promising for countries that are dealing with issues of fragility and weak governance systems. Uh, that's on one side, but it's also becoming more pertinent to uh, this idea of smart cities, which, um, which are seeing a proliferation of uh, Internet of Things or IoT devices, where in several sectors, such as transportation, water, electricity, uh, and, and when these data are collected primarily from devices such as sensors, uh, they also raise a number of challenges in terms of how do you responsibly govern uh, and control the use of data while protecting the data rights. Um, and um, so, you know, when you talk about all these different layers uh, around the data governance frameworks and we talk about data trusts, I think the issues would be the same for data trusts as well, in the sense they need to also look at uh, providing solutions for some of these barriers uh, that public sector or private sector entities are, uh, are facing and seeing how do they create trust uh, that can incentivize data providers, including private sector, right? So it's incentives does not stop just with private sector, in my view, because data trusts as we look at it, is going to bring together uh, many different types of data providers. Uh, so I think the fundamental sort of thing that they need to work out is how do you create this uh, it, it's trust and what, what is required uh, to, um, to make sure these uh, mechanisms are effective um, uh, and they do not exploit uh, you know, uh, those who contribute data. Uh, they do not facilitate anti-competitive conduct uh, or, you know, um, again, become this other sort of uh, source, uh, you know, of market power by accumulating value data, valuable data, uh, you know, over which the mechanisms maintain exclusive control. So I think some of the ways in which you could, uh, you know, also, you know, enable the creation of such mechanisms is to also work with city authorities or vertical ministries uh, to facilitate the creation of these mechanisms uh, and also build, I think, partnerships with regulators. Um, in one of the, um, in, I read an article with, which I thought had a really interesting discussion about creating these trusted data custodians who, uh, who are also able to discuss these trade-offs, right? I mean, there's always a trade-off in how you use the data and being very transparent about how these decisions over trade-offs trade are being made. Um, and so we don't kind of reach this, uh, this uh, scenarios like the Cambridge Analytica, where actually the issue over such uh, misuse of data was, was, is often reported through whistleblowers as opposed to actually being caught by regulators. So I think there has to be this relationship of these mechanisms being enabled um, you know, through partnerships with regulators and, uh, and other government entities who are enabling these mechanisms. Uh, and so while this kind of model of data trust can uh, thrive, uh, uh, you know, by following um, some of the principles of data governance that we discussed, even in the context of public, uh, public sector and private sector. Um, and, and I think the Indian example is often cited, uh, you know, where they've come up with this new uh, institution types, uh, which are called account aggregators. 
which is a very promising model. I mean, we, we still don't know the impact of those, but um, I think uh, some of those models are, are pretty promising. There are also other types of data, data trusts, uh, you know, data pools, um, you know, that are often even established for data exchange between private sector companies. I think one other thing, I'll, I'll probably end, I don't, I don't want to ramble for long, is that <laughs> one other point to keep in mind is also the international dimension uh, of these data trusts. Um, I think uh, we know that a lot of the, uh, for instance, uh, example, Africa reportedly has less than one person of the world's total available data processing center capacity while it contains 17% of the population. So there are very weak the infrastructure, um, uh, you know, in some of the more fragile and uh, poor countries. So keeping that in mind, then if if such the infrastructure for such data trusts um, will also play a key role in the sense that uh, how will cross issues such as cross border uh, will be managed by these uh, by these data trusts. Uh, uh, you know they, that needs to be taken into consideration as well because. Data often, uh, there's again more value from reuse when you're able to exchange data, not just within a country context, but also within the international, uh, uh, you know, across across countries and, and, and sectors. So uh, I just want to kind of end by saying that um, the processes, however they are organized, we have to have the intention of ensuring trustworthy stewardship of data uh, and verified through transparent processes and systems of accountability. Great, thanks, Malar. Uh, I think you just, uh, um, anyway, in in like five minutes, uh, uh, explained uh, uh, every possible issue <laughs> that we hope to address through uh, three months of uh, uh, of panels. Uh, so I could uh, uh, and I would eager to engage with you on every uh, aspect you mentioned, but I, I will try to constrain myself for now, and uh, and and go to Jamie, and um, and and I think Jamie, what. Um, what Malar was uh, referring to was uh, indeed what in, at GovLab, what we have done uh, quite some work around, which is of course this emerging concept of data stewardship and, 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 uh, and especially both at the institutional and at the professional level, uh, thinking in terms of what are the kinds of uh, uh, stewardship roles uh, that one needs to have and develop as it relates to data. So what I would like to know from you, Jamie, is that how is that uh, taking place within uh, a provincial setting? And uh, I mean, I think Malara pointed to a national data uh, uh, system, and then of course the importance of cross-national uh, kind of data flows in order to uh, deal with asymmetries of data uh, as well. But I think in the provincial setting, it's probably uh, clearly uh, more aligned with uh, some of the objectives that you might have with regard to transforming also public sector uh, engagement and so on. So eager to learn from you, Jamie, how does that resonate, what Malar uh, 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 here explained, how does it resonate within your context? Absolutely. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Uh, I've spent most of my career at the national level in the public sector, and I've spent the last year working at the subnational level. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit of color commentary uh, because I think that, that, that you know, you, you get to observe certain things when you change contexts. Um, and so it, it's fascinating to work in a, a local government because we are so much closer to service delivery for real people. Um, and I don't want to make it seem like uh, like multinational organizations or national governments don't provide services because that's not the case. But so often the services that we're providing are very intimate. So things like data stewardship are not, you know, things that we might, might want to think about. They are immediate needs that are urgent on a daily basis. Um, within Canada's federal structure, the provinces are responsible for fairly hefty service delivery, uh, education, healthcare, things that, you know, if, if they don't happen, people are going to notice immediately, <laughs> um, right? And so that kind of, that intimacy, that need to be very responsive to the needs of the citizens is something that we have very, very present in our minds literally every day. 
uh, when we talk about open data and open government writ large, so often we talk about, you know, the need for transparency, accountability, citizen participation, and those are all really wonderful and laudable goals. Um, one thing that, that we've certainly felt in an intimate way in the province is that those goals are, are just not complete. Um, the opportunity of open data goes far beyond that, and it really links to things like innovation and direct service delivery. Um, we, we are a lean government, um, and so we don't have a, a lot of resources to just pump out data for the sake of data and, you know, maybe somebody will find that data set and maybe they'll create, no, we, we're very much demand driven. Um, and so in that kind of a context, it seems really helpful to, to have these, these conversations around what is most valuable, what's definitely going to link into service delivery for the people of British Columbia. In our case, we've had an open data and open information policy in place th since 2011. Um, so BC was a, a relatively early mover in that regard. What I think is perhaps more interesting for this conversation is the progress that we've made in uh, managing some of what we refer to as gray data. Um, so as many uh, practitioners know, there, there are risks associated with open data um, when you aggregate disparate data sets in sort of unexpected ways. We, we have what we, we call the, the mosaic effect, right? And so you have a risk of re-identifying individuals or, or private information or, or information with, with security implications. And when it's coming to, to healthcare data, that's simply not a risk that we're able to manage. Right, um, like we're we're not willing to 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 risk those kinds of, of of privacy issues. So we've made a lot of progress, not just on open data, but in the management of other kinds of data. Um, so if you go onto our, our our data catalog, so catalog.data.gov.bc.ca, you'll find thousands of data sets, and those are available openly as open data. We also have made quite a bit of progress in releasing data as APIs which is very uh, positive and I think more aligned with uh, where the tech industry is going in many cases. We also have other kinds of ways of managing our data. Um, so one of them is really relating to Millar's uh, comment around data trusts. We manage our data innovation program. Uh, the data innovation program essentially is looking at kinds of data where there is a re, uh, some risk of re-identification, um, often through, through aggregation with disparate data sets. Um, and so we provide secure access to those data sets for accredited researchers. We've built out this program through a partnership with the University of British Columbia based in Vancouver. Um, and so we have that, that third party validation that our stewardship of the data is really sound. Um, and it allows us to put that data Data out there and have the innovation, have the research findings that, that we're trying to encourage um, while effectively managing some of the, the, the privacy risks that might come um, with some of that data. And I, I'm talking mostly about things that have really sensitive social implications, perhaps for, you know, there's uh, children in care, for example, um, healthcare type data. Um, and it, it's fascinating for me to see the extent to which people are really excited to engage on these issues. Um, as we were, were ramping up the data innovation program, we did run um, a, a series of, of conversations with British Columbians and convened a, a citizen panel to say, hey, how comfortable are you with this idea that we would be running, um, you know, providing secure access to, to, to anonymized data, but where there is risk associated. And there was a, a strong level of endorsement for the, the approach. I'm certainly not saying that every population around the world is going to be enthusiastic. Um, and I think really that speaks to the beauty of local government uh, because we're able to tailor our, our, our data offerings and our approaches to our diverse communities. Um, you know, the people of BC are perhaps different from some of the, the communities in, in the developing world that, that Millar was referencing. Um, and you know, that, that's wonderful. That's, that's what makes us so, so wealthy as, as, a, as a civilization that we have that diversity. And for us in the public sector, I would, I would argue that it's incumbent upon us to tailor our data offerings with um, the preferences and the needs of the communities that we serve. Um, so really, um, the, 
when it comes to sort of observing where we're at with local governments and, and data, uh, I think that the, the, the headline that I would give is that so often we, we are quite lean. Um, and so we, we very much align our data programming with the need for, for service delivery. Um, we align it very closely with um, the opportunity technology. Um, I obviously, uh, as the working in the, in, in the digital space, spent a lot of time thinking about how might we leverage the, the scarce resources that we do have to generate great service delivery. Um, and a lot of those initiatives are, are data-based. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, we, uh, on, you know, on, on the west coast of Canada, care very deeply about the environment. It is a, a sensitive um, environmental area. Um, and so we are really looking at things like carbon pricing, um, you know, and looking at uh, emissions targets and that sort of thing. Um, how are we going to actually make reasonable progress towards targets if we're not taking a data-driven approach? Um, so one of the pro projects that came through the BC Developers Exchange, our, our lab within the BC public sector, uh, last year was really an advanced data analytics project using various data sources for, um, for data. We used federal open data as well as provincial data, um, mashed them up, and we were able to, to do some, some analytics around the, the highest risk emitters. Um, and so those kinds of initiatives, yes, they leverage open data, but they, they serve a purpose that goes far beyond the, the transparency and accountability. It's really about making sure that we're safeguarding our environment. Um, you know, another great initiative that we had um, uh, just a, over a year ago was a, a data visualization project. Um, we have wildfires in, in my province every summer and they, they're devastating um, and they're very costly. Um, so any kind of uh, data analytics that we can have around predicted wild, wildfires spread and whatnot is, is very helpful. So we mashed up a variety of data sets, um, lightning strike data, historic fire spread, topographical maps, tree density, all that sort of thing. And we were able to create 3D maps that allowed uh, emergency response workers to visualize where those wildfires were likely to spread and plan their, their response, right? And so these kinds of things, um, it really is about much more than just putting out data, it's about the services that we're able to generate on top of that. Um, I, I think that, I'll, I'll just leave it with this, the, the idea uh, of sort of having these really agile and responsive teams has is, is been demonstrated as being far more critical than ever before in the face of, of COVID-19. Um, and, and I'd love to have that conversation with the panel, um, but for us really having the, those teams in place with the digital dexterity already in place, the, the ability to manage data, access data, derive insights from that data has been more important than ever in the, in the face of COVID-19. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, service delivery is really our focus when it comes to data. Great, thanks so much, Jamie, and, and thanks for also giving us some examples. It's always uh, uh, easier to talk about a kind of uh, a conceptual construct like data to actually also see how it is being used uh, in a variety of settings, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate uh, the examples here. So let's go to, to Arturo, uh, and I think uh, if we talk about headlines, I think the headline of uh, Malar was trust. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Jamie was clearly trust and service provision uh, from my point of view. And so Arturo, a question to you with regard to um, how you see the open data uh, community evolving to, towards also embedding more of uh, a, variety of, uh, open, uh, a variety of ways of going about opening data that might be seen as more trustworthy. Uh, I think at the beginning of open data, not that it was anyway, uh, uh, not trustworthy, but quite often uh, you had conversations that were not matched up uh, with regard to conversations around data ethics, and then you had conversations about open data. But now I think in the third wave, they are finally syncing up uh, in a more uh, rigorous manner. And so a question to you, Arturo, is how do you see this uh, playing out? Um, and uh, especially in the areas uh, that you work on, uh, uh, have you seen any progress towards that end or are there additional barriers as Malar has identified as well? 
Uh, well, okay, <laughs> thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a so, small, a small question, I know. It is, no, no, but but I think it's quite relevant, uh, especially uh, in the context that we're living right now with the pandemic. I, I think that that uh, uh, advance can be seen in the fact that we are asking these questions now. Uh, in and of itself, I think it's 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 quite a, 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 a an issue. So uh, I think that it goes back to um, I think uh, I've shared it uh, once with you. I think that in our effort. Uh, on the different data sort of conversations that, that the world has had uh, in, a, in the efforts to cross cut vertical silos, we've created horizontal silos. So, so you have the, the open data one, which is the one that probably gathers us now, but you also have the uh, data protection one. You have the cybersecurity one that has a lot to do with data. You have the uh, data driven decision making one, whatever, you know, one can understand with that. You have the uh, access to information one, which not always is the same, even though it's related in the first wave uh, to the open data one. You have the cross-border data regulation one. I mean, there are many conversations out there that are happening that include data, that are based on data, and not necessarily talking to each other. I think that that this trust, uh, uh, the trusts, not, not, not trusting that the, the actual data trusts conversation that both uh, Malar and Jamie referred to uh, mostly dealing with, with health or at least uh, the, the first uh, most notorious one was this tension between protection and, and opening right on, on the, the, the possibility of, of by opening you know somehow making uh, vulnerable uh, uh, some segments of the population but now we're seeing this 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 tension between uh, protection and, and, and data-driven decision-making in the context of uh, government's response to COVID. So, so how do you create a coordination uh, layer between all these uh, conversations? How do you uh, um, uh, make them uh, not only, first of all, recognize each other, which I think we're already getting there, but talking to each other and, and, and incorporating uh, each other in their own conversations so that we can have a holistic and comprehensive data approach uh, uh, I, th I think that's, that's something that's ongoing. I think that uh, we're moving towards it. Uh, my um, uh, basically uh, uh, illumination moment was uh, during the last uh, Latin America Regional Open Data Conference, the young conference part of it, uh, most of the uh, uh, conversations were about data protection from uh, the open data uh, community. And, 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 and you can see how, how that is evolving. Uh, so, so having these uh, governance um, arrangements, or, or in lieu of a better term, you know, a, a national data strategy that's very actionable, I think it's it's important. Uh, Canada has one. Uh, the U.S. I think has one. The U.K. is planning on, on on doing one, or at least is in the middle of the process of one. But but I think that's something that we should be uh, starting to uh, uh, look up to and, and, and promoting. Um, so, so trust. I think uh, uh, you, you you both covered on, on the on the data trusts, but I think that related also to trust is the uh, the aspect of quality, and and the first two waves have been all about pushing you know publication of data. I I even remember, uh, and I still believe it some to some point that you know even if you publish bad quality data, it will it, the, the publishing itself will help increase the quality of the data. But you know, it, it hasn't been that automatic and that fast and dynamic as I think we all expected. Last year, we did a, a survey among um, uh, AI entrepreneurship. By the way, AI strategies, IoT strategies, blockchain strategies, you know, those are also uh, these, these sort of horizontal uh, conversations that we're having. But we did a survey among uh, AI uh, initiatives in the region. And, and one of the, the things that struck us the most was uh, key, success, key success factors for AI and, 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 and ventures and main barriers for growth are the same. And they are quality of data and talent. And I think that can be extrapolated to the whole data ecosystem, including, of course, open data. So we've been pushing on the supply side. And I think we've been, uh, and I don't want to go on, on, on any questions I can say later, but I think we've been sort of uh, uh, assuming that the demand side is, is there and, and is, you know, avid and, and waiting for uh, that data to be published. And I, and I think it's a little more complicated than that and requires a little more tweaking than that. Um, and last, uh, uh, I just want to make a point. I think it has to do with trust. And it's 
that we've been in many countries uh, talking and, and, and being very vocal about open strategies and open culture and you know, solving wicked problems with design thinking approaches and agility and you know, reaching out to communities and, 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 and you know, uh, civil society, et cetera. But in comes a pandemia, you know, uh, I cannot think of a wicked best uh, problem than that. And, and how many of us have actually reached out to those uh, communities? How many of us have actually opened tables of conversation? How much of us have actually walked the talk? Uh, I, I reckon some have, but I don't think it has been the majority. So, so, you know, walking the talk, being faced with a crisis like this and still be able to, to do uh, what we are uh, uh, expected and promoting and, and saying we should be doing, I think it's, it's something that we should also uh, reflect upon. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Arturo. And again, <laughs> I would love to go in all directions. Uh, uh, and, and I agree with you, uh, Arturo, is that, um, as you know, I was very frustrated at the beginning. Uh, uh, and again, the question is, what's the beginning, right, of the, uh, of the pandemic that indeed, after years of conversation that we actually uh, did not walk the talk uh, when we were hit with a uh, pandemic, uh, like the one that we are currently experiencing. And the reason why uh, might actually also have been because of another element that you raised on, uh, which is the skill set uh, that uh, actually might be uh, lacking as well, in addition to the governance structures and all the other aspects that uh, uh, Malar has, uh, has pointed to. Uh, but also um, uh, quality, and, and I think uh, and again, without going into the thing, is that too often when data we are obsessed with uh, the the volume, the variety, and the velocity, but then the veracity of data, I think, has become more and more of an issue. And I think quite often we don't spend enough time on that. But I want to pick up one element also, which was linked with the walk, uh, the talk, which was about um, is the demand side ready? And, uh, and, and uh, if you are doing all this work with regard to the supply and is, um, uh, and, and do we have uh, a way to even understand the demand side for data? And, um, and then going to you, Malar, is that um, a lot of the uh, work you've done is to really nurture this data infrastructure. Uh, uh, but of course, there's this famous saying uh, that uh, if you build it, will they come, question mark. And, uh, and uh, do we actually know what is the demand and is the demand ready? I mean, it was actually very interesting at the beginning again of COVID-19, we were engaged with a lot of uh, data holders in the private sector and they complained to us is that we are ready to step in, <laughs> but no one is asking us. And, uh, uh, and, and there was a reason why, uh, uh, because there was no understanding on what, for instance, uh, the, the value of data could be uh, at a time of crisis. So, uh, Malar, how do we go about uh, not just de developing a supply side, but also really understanding and nurturing a demand side? I, I completely agree with you, Stefan. This, uh, this is one thing we're also being sort of uh, careful about in the report, not to come across being very naive to say that, oh, let's build all these complex structures and invest in all of this, but uh, with the understanding that, oh, sure, then the data gets used, right? And and definitely, I think, uh, you know, creating that demand and, uh, you know, creating those incentives for people to actually use the data for, like, uh, you know, Jaime said, for actual service delivery at, you know, more needed issues is, uh, I think, is important. And uh, I, I don't think I have, like, a clear answer or a blueprint for that, but I think definitely COVID-19 presents a very interesting um, sort of scenario, right? I mean... Uh, if you see, you have websites sort of coming up on a daily basis, reporting on data, the need for us to, you know, every day morning go and check, you know, COVID case data. Of course, there are still a lot of issues in terms of, uh, you know, comparability or, you know, data on hospital systems, but still there is this constant demand that's been generated, which is also why, uh, you know, now, you know, we are continuing to collect data. Uh, either through these contract tracing apps or even like, um, you know, these phone surveys that many organizations, including the World Bank, are conducting because it's generated through the demand. I think it's something to look at to see how we can maybe use some of those lessons to, uh, you know, apply it to other types of data that exists, uh, you know, where we're not collecting even some of the more foundational information. 
Um, and so some, some sort of uh, ideas uh, that we're kind of looking at is, uh, of course, uh, you know, the sort of political economy considerations, right? I mean, I think we cannot ignore, we cannot assume that data by itself alone is going to sort of uh, just directly, I mean, change uh, the interventions, right, that we need to provide. There are many other factors that are uh, that play a role, uh, particularly things like the political economy considerations, but also I think uh, it's about creating this, uh, uh, you know, a data culture. I think creating the culture and the mindset of people to actually uh, use data effectively to provide uh, services. I mean, it's great to hear someone like Jaime who's in the public sector, who's, and there are many people, I'm not saying, but uh, who think like that. Uh, but but still that culture of and, and providing a leadership actually that brings data uh, central to policy making and public service delivery is going to be key. Um, and I think uh, a few other sort of linked um, uh, concepts to that is investing in human capital in general. I mean, we, we all discussed that, but also in providing some early education uh, around data. For instance, uh, I think, Est I mean, Estonia is often cited as the best example for many things, but even this, uh, they also did do uh, sort of a similar, uh, I think they call it Tiger Leap or something like that, where they came up and with, with a more intentional way of educating their future generation uh, in data skills. So I think that sort of investment uh, in public sector, but also for the general population is going to be key. So when, you, when we also talk about having this engagement um, you know, the future to all, all of this is going to be multi-stakeholder, right? Different parties coming together to decide, uh, uh, like what Jaime said, it's not about, you know, just let's put all data out there, but it's also about, you know, what data is, is useful, what, what's more effective, but even to have a conversation like that, or for people to be more, uh, for governments, I mean, for people to make governments more accountable, you need them to be more literal, literate in this space. Um, so I think investing in human capital and building this data science skills, changing the culture, bringing in a leadership that understands, um, you know, primarily in pub public sector, I think that that can put data, uh, that can think of data as an asset, I think is going to become important uh, for having a more sustainable long-term intervention and not looking at a short-term kind of checkbox, uh, you know, sort of approach as, it, as I think it still is the case in some countries. I'll stop with this. Uh. No, thanks, thanks, Malar, and um, uh, and and thanks for 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 those those issues. And I, I want to build upon that um, and and go to to Jamie uh, as well. Um, with uh, I think what uh, one element that uh, Malar said was the the, the importance of um, uh, multi-stakeholder kind of or at least uh, ways to engage different kinds of stakeholders. And uh, and I think it was very interested to hear Jamie. Um, uh, your uh, experience with the Citizens Council. And, uh, and so one of the elements that we also uh, have looked into is a need, how do you not have this conversation without actually <laughs> engaging both the benef ben beneficiaries, uh, but also the ones that eventually provide the data. And, uh, and so tell us a little bit more, Jamie, uh, uh, around the Citizens Councils and how you engage citizens uh, again, that might be more ideal at the local level, uh, but then also, uh, given the fact that we are uh, reaching our time here, uh, unfortunately, um, tell us a little bit about the citizens, citizens councils, but also uh, if you would do um, uh, have a magic wand and you would be able to do one uh, kind of intervention, what, would, what do you think is a um, transformative intervention that we could uh, uh, aspire that actually would accelerate this third wave and would make your life much easier, Jamie? That's a, a wonderful question. And I love it when, when somebody like, like you, Stefan, gives me a magic wand. I wish this could actually happen. Anytime, um, anytime. <laughs> So for me, the, the magic wand response is very similar to, to the response to the question around citizen-driven approaches to data. If I could change one thing about how we manage data, about how we, how we advance open data, it would be that we would truly, genuinely take a user-based approach, a people-based approach to delivering on these services. Um, because providing data is a service. It's not a neutral activity. It's something that has deep, deep implications for our community 
communities, for our rights in a digital world, um, for so much more than just the existence or non-existence of the data set in the public domain. So for me, the magic wand question would be that every, every entity that, that manages data, that has the privilege to touch data, um, would understand the, the, the critical importance of delivering that data in ways that really does respond to the needs of our communities. Um, and that's a hard thing. It means recognizing that, you know, that, that we have bias in our data so often, you know, people are, are, are all up in arms around the bias of the algorithms. The algorithms, yeah, sure, they're biased. The data is way worse. The humans, those of us who build these things, we're way worse, <laughs> right? At least you can correct for the bias of the algorithms, um, right? And so having that, that kind of, that commitment to building out our services, to releasing data, to sharing data, to stewarding that data on the basis of the needs of, of our very diverse communities. I think that that's just so critical. There are lots of ways that we, that we can do that. Um, Within, within BC, I think that we focused very heavily on ensuring that we're providing um, data that, that does allow us to deliver great services. Um, and I'll give a couple examples from COVID. I've seen wonderful cases of this around the world. Um, you know, until last year, I had the privilege of serving on Canada's multi-stakeholder forum on, on open government. Uh, that was a cross-sector body where we had representation from civil society, academia, um, the private sector and, and government. And that was the body that was really helping to, to shape the Government of Canada's approach to open government and open data. Those kinds of approaches, I think, are, are very important. Um, many of us have been somewhat seized by the, the, the opportunities associated with the International Open Data Charter. Um, and there, you know, last year as we were looking at, at doing a little bit of a reset um, for the Charter, the priorities that emerged were one, publish with purpose. So how are you going to know your purpose if you aren't talking to your users? To, to the people you serve, right? And then really ensuring that the, that the release of data was aligned with opportunities and emerging technology. Um, but technology really is, is useless unless it's for some higher purpose. Um, so for me, the, the importance of this user-centered approach really did reveal itself through, through our COVID response. Um, and the lessons that, that I took from that, you know, I'm, I'm a long-standing data nerd. Um, data is not enough. It, it really isn't, it never is enough. Data, technology, without the policy, the governance, the engagement with, with the people we serve, without those things, they're just lines of code or numbers. Um, you know, and so we do have to be, I think, somewhat rigorous, um, particularly in the public sector where, where our work is being funded through tax dollars, where we have an explicit mandate to, to serve our communities. We have to be rigorous with ourselves in explaining what we're up to, why. You know, we in the BC government have gone to great lengths to, to be an open source government. If you go to github.com slash bcgov, you'll see about 800 repositories. Um, when we build things, we build it in the open because it makes things better, because we can collaborate, um, you know, and that's, that's wonderful. But we collectively have to get better at not just putting our code base out, not just putting our data, but bringing our communities along and saying, we're building a contact tracing app because you know we're concerned about the following things and this is how we're protecting your data and this is you know this is why we think it's a good idea um and i think that when we do design for for the better angels of our communities um a lot of times the better angels show up uh so that that's been a big a big part of uh, what i've learned through the COVID response the data is not enough digital dexterity must improve really um and and i'm not just talking about public servants here um we need to invest in digital dexterity in our communities also in with with our partners um we need to adopt things like data standards across the board um to the extent possible these should be aligned between governments um not just within a government but i would i would love to see common data standards across you know all local governments across all all um you know iadb uh, members all that sort of thing i think that we have a tremendous opportunity there um you've got your work cut out for you <laughs> um 
right? But aligning around those data standards makes it much easier for us to use that, the data. I started my career in the public sector as an economist, and I have to say there, there are months of my life that I don't get back because I spent them cleaning data. Let's stop spending our time doing things like that. Let's make sure that we're putting out assets that are, that are highly usable um, and that are sort of, that are shovel ready to the extent possible. Um, so that digital dexterity is important. The, the nimbleness, the, the existence of teams, teams that can have the, the knowledge of the communities, the, the ability to, to use design thinking and human-centered design processes to validate the approaches, um, you know, and, and really making sure that, that we have the governance and the policies that are in place. Like, it, it's, it's, again, not the sexiest work to say, okay, let's talk about data governance, but data in the absence of governance and policies is, in my view, really not very responsible, nor is it sustainable. So tremendous opportunities in this space. Um, we, we can do more. Technology and data really can and should help. Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, thanks so much. And, and so Arturo, um, let me go to you and, and you will have the final word here because uh, uh, I'm sensitive to the time. Uh, and unfortunately, I cannot give you a magic wand because I already gave it to Jamie. Uh, uh, but if, oh, if <laughs> sorry, I only have one. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but if, uh, um, again, si similar kind of question, if, uh, um, if there is a, a set of priorities that you feel uh, strongly to advance in order to uh, build this kind of uh, um, uh, foundation upon which we can build, uh, what would be the priorities that you would uh, uh, elevate and, and would want us all to work uh, towards? So, uh, I, I mean, there, there, are many, there are many things there and it's an unfair question without a magic wand, but... Um, I do have uh, a, a, a genie bottle. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so I, I, I cannot think of any uh, long-term uh, sustainable solution that doesn't go through education. So that's a must. I mean, uh, uh, Malar uh, mentioned it. I think that that has to be there anyway. Uh, we need to know that 15 years from now, this conversation is going to be unnecessary. It's, it's already there, right? So that's, that's definitely. The other, the other thing I think always helps is to show to show and, and, and show like demonstrate that this conversation has an impact on economic growth and on quality of life. This is not, you know, a fairy tale. This is not a nice to have. This is not something that, you know, it would look nice if we did this. This actually improves the lives of people. This actually creates more equity. This actually creates economic growth. And, and it's not a hard thing to do because you know the, the link between data and, and economic growth I, I don't think it's that hard but sometimes you need to show that it's not a 10-year bet it's not a unsurmountable you know barrier it's something that you can do little by little and it takes both sides on the demand side and on the supply side and and, and then of course the actual whatever analogy there is to the marketplace of that data right I mean I mean they need to meet somewhere and they need to to exchange and they need to create value so so um, I know that it's not one thing uh, it, but but I think it it also in, in includes that uh, we need to to make people aware that this actually improves uh, uh, the life of people great wonderful Malar, Arturo, Jamie, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, and I'm sure anyone uh, and everyone who listens to this uh, 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 series uh, will learn a lot as well, and hopefully this will really provide the foundation for the third wave uh, of open data. Thanks so much.